Hello, hope you're doing well and welcome to another video in the playlist all about energy metabolism. This video is going to take a deep dive into glycolysis, our glycolytic energy system. So if you haven't seen the other videos in this playlist yet, I'd encourage you to go back and watch the playlist from the beginning because the videos kind of follow on one after the other and it'll really help you to understand this video. But by the end of this video, you're going to have a better understanding of the, the basics and the fundamentals of glycolysis, as well as some of the more detailed aspects of some of the steps in the process, how they're regulated and what they do, and also some of the influencing factors around the glycolytic energy system. So I hope you enjoy it, and don't forget to keep track of what's going on on the channel. The best way is to hit the subscribe button, click on the bell for notifications of all the upcoming content. Enjoy. Okay, glycolysis. Let's start as a sensible. From the beginning, have a little look at some of the basics about glycolysis, the breakdown or partial breakdown of glucose. So here's the structure of glucose. Okay, we take in other carbohydrates, but they all get converted to glucose. That's the only source of carbohydrate the body can use for energy. Six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. And of course, we take in carbohydrate in our food, which gets converted to glucose primarily in the liver, if it's not glucose already. But we can also produce glucose from non-carbohydrate sources in the liver and the skeletal muscle. So we can find glucose in the blood, in the form of blood glucose. We can find it in our skeletal muscles in the form of glycogen, which is stored glucose. And we can find it in the form of liver glycogen as well. So those are the three main storage sites for glucose. We don't have a huge amount of it though. It depends on body size and composition and diet, uh, but the average sort of 75 kilogram man is gonna have approximately, uh, with regards to uh, blood glucose, around about maybe 17 grams of blood glucose at any one time, which is about 68 calories worth. In terms of liver glycogen, roughly 125 grams, which is about 500 calories worth. And in the skeletal muscle, which is the largest store, maybe about 575 grams, which is around about 2,300 calories worth. Glycolysis itself takes place in the sarcoplasm of our muscle cells, okay, the liquid part of the muscle outside of the mitochondria. Same place where phosphocreatine metabolism takes place. Okay, so now let's get into glycolysis in a bit more detail. Let's look at the nuts and bolts of it. So first of all, the process of glycolysis is referred to as substrate level phosphorylation, which literally means the direct transfer of a phosphate from a substrate to another substrate. And that's what glycolysis essentially is, movement of phosphates. And here it is. It's pretty complex. It's much more complex than phosphocreatine. You may have watched my other video on the phosphocreatine system. This has got a bit more to it, okay? It's a, it's a 10 step sequence of reactions that gradually break down glucose, a glucose molecule every time the process completes. Here are the steps, okay? And each of these 10 steps is controlled or catalyzed or regulated by a specific enzyme in order to accomplish that particular, that particular step that needs to happen. The final step is sometimes classed as the 11th step and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. Glycolysis can also use glycogen. We can take a glucose molecule from our stored muscle glycogen and we can bring that into glycolysis, which enters at step two of the process, which is really important to remember and we'll see why in a moment. So we can use glucose or we can use glycogen. And at the end of the process, we can produce pyruvate and lactate. But let's first of all start at the beginning with step one, controlled by the enzyme hexokinase. And this is where we convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So in order to do that, we need to actually take a phosphate from ATP. So we're actually using an ATP molecule here, rather than actually making an ATP molecule. So at the moment, after step one, when we use glucose, we're down an ATP, we've got a net loss. Same as it's step three, that also involves the transfer of a phosphate from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-biphosphate or diphosphate. That requires the use of ATP as well, so we're now down to ATP. So what's going on? This is an energy system. Why is it using ATP? That's just the way it works. Within these first three steps, two of them cost us ATP. 
This third step is really important, the, the step catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. It's the rate-limiting reaction. This is one of the ways that glycolysis regulates itself to ensure that it works in concert with our energy demands. When our ATP levels are high, this reaction, this step of glycolysis, slows down, which slows down the whole system. When citrate levels are high, which indicate that the aerobic energy system is working at a high rate, this stage of glycolysis will slow down. So this helps to regulate glycolysis so it's in line with our energy demand. And similarly, when we have high ADP concentrations and high AMP, adenosine monophosphate concentrations, this step of glycolysis speeds up. So the whole process of glycolysis speeds up and provides us with more energy. So step three is crucial. It's a rate limiting reaction. Helps to control and match the rate of glycolysis to our energy demands. Steps four and five are also really important because in step four, two molecules are produced, as you can see here. And then very quickly, this first molecule is reconstituted. So we end up with two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. And from this point on, we have two of each molecule that you see moving through glycolysis. Okay, and that's quite important to remember. And also this step here is where we produce hydrogen in glycolysis. There's other videos in the channel talking about the importance of that and why we need to produce hydrogen and what the consequences of that are. But this is with the step where hydrogen is produced. Moving down to step seven, we see the first production of ATP in glycolysis. We know we've already lost two ATP. It's not until step seven that we actually start producing it. But because we're now working with two molecules each at each step, we actually produce two molecules of ATP here. You can almost think of two arms of glycolysis proceeding parallel now. Everything you see here occurs in duplicate. And then stepping down to step 10, this is the second point at which ATP is produced, the conversion of phosphoenylpyruvate to pyruvate. And again, two molecules of ATP are produced here. So we've produced now four molecules of ATP from glycolysis. So it doesn't produce a lot of ATP, but really important. Now when pyruvate is produced at the end of glycolysis, it can move into the Krebs cycle and be further broken down for more energy in aerobic metabolism. And that's commonly referred to as aerobic glycolysis if pyruvate is the end product. But pyruvate can also be converted to lactate and in that situation, we often refer to it as anaerobic glycolysis. Now, I don't like that because what it suggests to somebody is that the system is different depending on whether it's aerobic glycolysis with pyruvate or whether it's anaerobic glycolysis with lactate. It isn't. The process of glycolysis is identical. It's always the same. And we're always producing pyruvate and lactate interchangeably. So I don't like this distinction of aerobic versus anaerobic glycolysis, and I'd encourage you to not think of it in that way because it can be confusing. Just think of it as glycolysis and learn its purpose and what it does in our energy systems. So pyruvate can move into the Krebs cycle and take, take part in aerobic metabolism. But if the rate at which glycolysis occurs is much faster than that of aerobic metabolism, we can get an accumulation of pyruvate. It can start to build up because it's not moving into the Krebs cycle as quickly as we like. And we can also get a, a, an accumulation of hydrogen as well because that's not being dealt with and moved through to aerobic metabolism. The process of converting pyruvate to lactate actually, first of all, lowers the pyruvate concentration, so it prevents that buildup of pyruvate, but it also recycles these hydrogen carriers that you can see here and allows them to go away and pick up more hydrogen because the, the conversion of pyruvate to lactate consumes hydrogen. So the production of lactate is really important. Glycolysis can produce ATP at a rate of about 4.5 millimoles of ATP per kilo of dry mass per second, which doesn't mean a huge amount, let's face it. So let's put it into context for our other energy systems. The rate of glycolysis is about half as fast as the rate of phosphocreatine, um, or the rate of ATP replenishment from phosphocreatine. It's about 1.6 times faster than glycogen oxidation, and it's about four and a half times faster than the oxidation of glucose and the oxidation of fat. So it gives you an idea about the speed. It's pretty, it's pretty fast. It's our second fastest energy system. So the net gain for a, for a molecule of glucose that moves through glycolysis, we get a net gain of two 
ATP molecules. Because remember, we spend two near the beginning and we, we create four a little bit later on in the process at steps seven and ten. If we're using glycogen, now remember I said at the beginning there that uh, glycogen skips the first step of glycolysis. It goes in at step two. Step one loses an ATP. So when we use glycogen directly, we get a net three ATPs because we're skipping that first step, which means that we're only breaking down one ATP. We're creating four, so we get a net three ATP gain. So let's finish by talking about some of the influencing factors around the glycolytic energy system. First things first, training status, aerobically versus anaerobically trained. Generally speaking, anaerobically trained people are able to produce ATP at faster rates through glycolysis. Uh, the speed at which glycolysis works will depend in large part on the speed at which some of those key enzymes function that we talked about when we looked at glycolysis in detail. Anaerobic training can speed up the activity of those key regulatory enzymes, meaning that you can produce ATP at a faster rate through glycolysis. So that's where the advantage may be for a more anaerobically trained individual. Supplementation with certain substances such as beta alanine, for example, may help to uh, increase the perhaps rate at which ATP can be produced in glycolysis or the capacity of the system. But as usual with, with supplementation, there's a lot of conflicting evidence. Fuel availability, we need carbohydrate, we need glucose for glycolysis to work. It's the only thing that goes through glycolysis, glucose. And we can lose quite a large amount of our, of our stores of carbohydrate during really high intensity activity, particularly if we're doing all out sprints. That can go down pretty quickly. And of course, that's going to have a negative impact on how glycolysis is going to function. We've already touched on how pyruvate accumulation in glycolysis can limit its effectiveness and limit the, uh, the function of the system. So we don't want pyruvate to be accumulating too much. And that's why we, we try and convert it to lactate to prevent that accumulation from occurring. And also the buildup of hydrogen acidic atoms in our muscle tissue can impact on the enzyme function around glycolysis and lead to uh, a slowing up and a, and, a, and a deterioration in the function of the system. So again, we've got ways in which we can hopefully try and prevent too much hydrogen accumulation from occurring. So I hope this has been useful for you, a fairly in-depth uh, overview of glycolysis, really important to understand for any sport and exercise scientists, physical education, students, coaches, practitioners. So I hope you got something from it. Uh, keep an eye out for other videos in this series. The next one's going to be on aerobic metabolism. As always, get involved in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Any questions, uh, it'd be great to, to have a chat. Take care, and I'll see you soon for another video.